The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others said, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. But then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. You'll be seated. God's grace and God's peace be your grace and your peace. Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Or you can listen to the Thank you, Bill and Bennett. <laughs> the question of identity, who are you? It's the framework for our gospel today. We could also ask it this way, what's in a name? What's in your name? Let's start there. You might be a Johnson. That is, a son of or from the family of John. You could be a smith, which means you're part of a family lineage attached to metal workers. You could be a brando, which means your family is attached to fire. You could be a curran, and from the Gaelic meaning we hold spears. You could be a Nathan or a Dorothy, which means gift of God. And then there are a whole host of nicknames. From the authoritative work called Wikipedia, they tell us. Nickname, a substitute for a person's name that can be used to express affection, amusement, or to characterize someone. We called her Aunt Ginny. She was not related to us at all, but Ginny, Aunt Ginny, was my mom's dearest friend. Ginny was over for dinner one evening, and while there, I was absolutely baffled why she kept calling my mother Dot. 
I knew my mom as mom. Aunt Jenny knew my mom as dot. I finally dialed up enough courage to grab the hem of my mom's dress and tug on it, and she leaned over, and I said, who is she calling dot? And every time she calls dot, you answer, what's going on here? My mom laughed, and she said, it's short for Dorothy. That's what Ginny calls me. When I graduated from high school, I was a stunning five feet tall. <laughs> when I graduated from college, I had arrived at five foot nine. But now, gravity has checked in. <laughs> and I am, well, shorter. <laughs> in junior high, I received my first odd nickname. I'll share that nickname with you if you promise to forget it as soon as worship is over, or you tell me mine, yours, I'll tell you mine, and then that's what we'll call each other. Deal? Shorty Doherty. <laughs> Biblical names were of the utmost importance. Your name attached you to a heritage, a lineage, a family, an identity. From Matthew in the first chapter, we read, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, who was the son of Abraham, Abraham the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and you can read the entire first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It is lineage, it is identity, it is heritage, and it concludes with this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Lineage, heritage provided you with a certain standing in the community, a connection, a royal line for some, and ultimately this provided you an inheritance. Jesus asked his followers directly, who do they say that I am? Do I have standing? Do I have a place with these people? Am I respected, revered, acknowledged? When Jesus asked the question of identity, he knew the weight of titles. He knew that in the community, amongst his disciples, they were saying, Jesus, we know you as the Messiah. So he wanted to poke at that a little bit and check it. Jesus knew that for the community, they had a certain definition of the word Messiah. It meant something wildly different for Jesus. Today, we use a set of identity markers for Jesus. We say, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's a title found in our liturgies, in our hymns, in our creeds, in our prayers. What that meant for Jesus' followers in the first century was that Jesus, as they looked at him, they said, Jesus, you're our Lord. But in Jesus' day, there was only one Lord, and it wasn't Jesus. It was Caesar. You see, all of the statues of Caesar all of the coins of the realm or the empire, the imperial terminology of the time, all called Caesar Lord. Caesar was the original son of God and savior of the world. That's how Caesar wanted to be known, and there could be no others. So you can imagine what turmoil began to spin up when one of the titles that the disciples used of Jesus was, he's our Lord. And from Lord, 
quickly they said, slid over to, not only are you our Lord, you are our Christ. Know this, those terms, they are politically loaded. Those were terms that were aimed at the most important person in the Roman universe. So to say that Dan is Lord means somebody else isn't. A little word history. By the time the word Messiah is translated into the language of the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and Luke, the word used was Christos. In Greek, a word for the anointed one. And the anointed one was also a job description. If you were the anointed one, your job, save the people. Your job as anointed one was to rain down fury on the oppressors and free or save the whole of the Israelite community from slavery, subjugation, and taxation. The people around Jesus expected him to literally overthrow and defeat the whole of the Roman Empire and thus establish a new kingdom, a kingdom of God. So when Simon Peter looks at Jesus and says, you, you're the anointed one, the son of the living God, Jesus responded, well, thank you very kindly, but please keep it to yourself because that kind of stuff will get me killed and ultimately it will get you killed. So button it. Wait, Jesus, you don't want me to call you the Christ, my Christ, my anointed one who's going to save me? You can call me that, Jesus says, but the salvation you want me to bring is not the salvation I will deliver. What Jesus is saying is this. I will not be doing battle with your enemies. I will help you in your battle with your enemies so you turn them from enemy into friend. I will not wage war to win your freedom, as popular as that is. I will, however, free you from your tribalism that has you living with the illusion that you are superior to others. I will not be taking rule of the throne like you want me to. No, instead, I'll hang on a cross and save you from all that separates you in your relationship with God. I will do this with grace and mercy, forgiveness and hope. I will lay down my life for you. So when you say, Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord, appreciate the impact. And when Jesus tells us who he is, we ought to believe him. And who are you, Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Perhaps this. We are followers of Jesus Christ, the anointed one, whose identity is found in a life of love without counting the cost, who has an endless supply of grace, who lives with untethered compassion, who provides a peace that we can barely understand and is the one who delivers you eternal life. And in exchange, what does Jesus ask of us? Jesus asks us 
to trust that as truth. And then follow him. Amen.